Good morning again. I guess we can get started. There are a few more people entering the auditorium. It's my privilege to welcome you back to the second day of Tech Focus 2, Caring for Film and Slide Art, generously hosted and co-organized by the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. As many of you know, the idea of the workshop series Tech Focus was born out of the electronic media group of the AIC and received tremendous support from the other institutions. A project like this would not have been possible without additional generous funding. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the funders and supporters of Tech Focus 2. Again, the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Smithsonian Institution Archives, the Foundation of the American Institute of Conservation, the internal Smithsonian Institutions Funds from the Consortium for Understanding the American Experience and the Consortium for the World Cultures. Thank you. And of course, a big thank you to all our Tech Focus speakers, moderators, the Tech Focus 2 planning committee, volunteers, and the founders of EMG. <coughs> Paul Messier is in the room. Without our group, wouldn't exist. And a very big note of appreciation to Tech Focus coordinator and program chair, Jeff Martin. But I also would like to express my thanks to Susan Lake, who has been an amazing supporter of this event and also is taking care of the coffee and the catering and the reception. Thank you, Susan. Another big note of appreciation to um, Sarah Gordon, who has been an amazing supporter of this event too, as well as Bob Batley, <coughs> the projectionist in the booth. Um, it is great to see you here and to have you here, and I'm happy to report that we have international speakers from seven speakers and participants from seven different countries, namely United Kingdom, Germany, Mexico, the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, and Canada. The series of planned tech focus workshops on the preservation and presentation of electronic art categories started in 2010 with the inaugural Tech Focus One Caring for Video Art held at the Guggenheim Museum in New York and acknowledged the 10th anniversary of the groundbreaking Tech Archaeology Symposium that was held at SF MoMA in 2000, which was conceived by the EMG founder Paul Messier and Mona Jimenez who should be also here in the room. Thank you. The Tech Focus series is organized in response to requests that we receive from our membership. Our EMG members repeatedly pointed out that they struggle to define their role and responsibility in electronic art preservation at their institution. And also the idea was raised earlier by Sarah Staudemann to have <coughs> us coming together to discuss um, certain topics in electronic media preservation. And the, um, there is, um, in part, a lack of education and research in our field, as well as the technical nature of the artworks itself drive us into challenges to define our roles in our institution. And this is also due to an overlap of departmental responsibilities between conservators, curators, archivists, technicians, registrars, and art handlers. Tech Focus is meant to bring us all together to contribute and strengthen the education in our field, to work towards facilitating a common language and protocols to preserve electronic art, to develop a body of literature, and to reach out into a larger group of the professional public. During the months of preparation of our two first Tech Focus workshops, there, was so, there were so many highly motivated, passionate, and enthusiastic colleagues involved. A huge amount of positive energy was created, and we are very excited to now have the opportunity again to share it with you. The workshop content today will provide a comprehensive overview of the parameters endangering or challenging the integrity of film and slide-based artworks and will build on yesterday's topics of the technical overview, filmmaking process, acquisition and creation of exhibition copies of slide and film. 
First, we will look into practical aspects of installation and exhibition of slide and film projections. This technical knowledge is essential to see how technical decisions and use of equipment influence the image quality. The speakers will provide image material and image comparison that will help to determine how technical details translate into the image structure and quality. The information that will be provided today will put you in the position to make more technically and aesthetically informed decisions that become part of your collection preservation plan. The day will then be rounded up with the School of Seeing, which will introduce you to a literally eye-opening session of projected images. Are you an EMG member yet? If not, please consider <laughs> joining us and support our programming and publications. By joining us, you will receive a free copy of the new biannual publication, the EMG Review, which is brand new. Uh, this publication covers talks that are presented at the EMG session um, at the ASC annual meeting. The electronic media review is distributed as a benefit to our members who held membership during the respective years of the issue. As mentioned yesterday, and I can't do without, I would also like to point you to the AIC Guide to Digital <coughs> Photography and Conservation Documentation. This comprehensive publication covers all aspects of digital photography, of works of art and cultural heritage, and is written specifically for you, for conservators and collection care custodians. <coughs> Please find more information on both publications in your folder, and thank you to a big thank you to the editor, Jeffrey Water. <laughs> we also encourage you to use our Tech Focus 2 Facebook and Twitter presence to continue our discussions even beyond this conference. Please use this media, which are such a great tool to reach out to allied experts in our highly specialized field. Thank you, and please now enjoy the second day of Tech Focus 2. It's my pleasure to um, now introduce Sarah Gordon, who is a time-based media coordinator at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden here in Washington. And in her role at the museum, she is responsible for the installation, maintenance, and documentation of all time-based media arts, both from the collection as well as loaned works. Before coming into this role, Sarah worked at the museum for two and a half years as an art handler. She gained valuable experience installing all different types of artwork. Sarah graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Arts and Management and a minor in Art History from the Appalachian State University in Boone, <coughs> North Carolina. Please also allow me to say that she is the one person at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden that is focusing full-time on time-based media. Her responsibilities are spanning a wide range of activities and are touching also conservation issues as well as into the registered work. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Gordon. Thank you. Among the various technologies commonly used in time-based media installations, 35 millimeter slide installations are unique in that they not only require the media to complete the artwork, they also require sequences of specific actions to be performed by the machines that display the media. This is in direct contrast with most film and video work, in which time is expressed in the media itself and the projection equipment is relatively passive. Determining what the final presentation needs to look like and how it should behave is the first step in selecting which equipment will be necessary. Whether you have a show with one slide projector or 20, proper equipment selection is vital to the installation's success. A second unique challenge that comes along with working with slide installations is that the equipment and the slides were typically not created to be used in long-term gallery installations. 
nor even displayed unattended for long periods of time. To illustrate the extremes to which these machines and media are pushed, the Hirshhorn is open for 364 days a year for seven and a half hours a day. If you had a full tray of 80 slides and each slide was on view for one minute, then the projector would be completing 163,800 changes per year and each slide would spend more than 34 hours in front of a hot lamp. Most of these projectors, and for that matter, the slides themselves, were not designed for that kind of severe use. It is up to us for plan, excuse me, it is up to us to plan for this exceptional abuse and preempt any potential problems. I'd also like to say up front that this is based on current information and practical experience. There are many different ways to address these issues, and I look forward to questions and discussion. The first step in selecting your equipment should be determining which family of projectors will best suit your needs. Since slide works are often decades old, detailed installation specifications may no longer exist if they even did in the first place. And if the spe specifications do exist, the equipment may no longer be available. Codex ceased production of slide projectors in 2004, and availability of the machines is only getting worse from here on out. It's up to us to display the work as closely to the artist's intention using the diminishing resources that are available to us. Luckily for now, Kodak has an amazing collection of materials available online about all of the slide projectors they manufactured over the years. There are also people like Ken Kobolenski at KX Camera in Santa Barbara, California, who have an affinity for these, these machines and keeping them alive in our galleries. I'm going to primarily focus on Kodak's equipment since they were the main manufacturer. There are two major families of projectors that are still around today the Ectographic 3 and the Ectopro. The Ectographic 3 machines are more common and there are many different models in this family since it was in production from 1981 to 2004. I'll speak about them first. All of the Ectographic models have a single lamp. Some have high brightness lamp modules that increase the brightness by 30%. You can tell the difference between these by the look of the outside of the machine, but also by the color of the module itself. It's important that multi-channel installations use the same type of lamp modules across all projectors so that color temperature and brightness match. Lamp modules that are silver or gray are regular models and black modules are the high brightness variety. Like other technologies that use a lamp, age, hours of use, and manufacturing variations have impacts on the brightness and color temperature. To some degree, it's a matter of trial and error to assemble a set of projectors with lamps that match acceptably. The Ectographic comes in manual and autofocus. This varies model to model. Some of these machines have a timer that allows you to cycle through the slides at set intervals, which can be useful if you have a full tray of 80 slides or a piece that allows for blank slides to be projected. These projectors also have a seven pin connection for dissolve units and a five pin connection to be used with a remote. This wired remote almost always offers forward and reverse of the slide tray and some offer focus buttons, but that's the extent of their functionality. There's also a smaller eight pin special application receptacle, which allows home tinkerers to create their own controls. Kodak's website has a wiring diagram for this input. The second major family of projectors is the Ecta Pro and it has a whole new set of fe features. Introduced in 1991, this is the most modern line of projectors to be manufactured. And like the rest of Codex line, production ceased in 2004. This family is a more sophisticated and rob robust evolution of the ectographic. This is immediately obvious to even the untutored observer simply based on the number of control buttons, input options, and general look of these machines. Where the Ectographic had one or two motors, the Ectopro has four microprocessor controlled motors, making them generally more reliable and more repairable. All of the Ectopro models have a return to zero function, where if the carousel is less than half full, after it is run through all the slides, the machine will automatically re rewind and return to the home position to start the show over. Like the Ectographics, the Ectopro also came in manual and autofocus and has a built-in timer. But unlike the Ectographics, the Ectopro offered models that have dual lamp modules where you can choose to have the high brightness of two lamps or use one as a backup that will automatically power on if the first lamp is no longer functioning. The final Ectopro model made before production stopped was the 9020. Both the earlier 7020 and 9020 models have built-in dissolve functions allowing you to program several projectors to work together to dissolve one image into the next. 
These projectors also have an RS-232 in and out, which allows a computer to be connected to control fade, dissolve, and overlap of up to 16 projectors simultaneously. You can also use these inputs to daisy chain multiple projectors. Ectopros also allow you to choose between a cabled remote and an infrared remote control, much like the sort that you use for your home television. The remote requires the use of a receiver, which would have been sold separately from the projector. The receivers can also be connected using an extension cord. So if you want to control multiple projectors with one remote, you just need to place the receivers near each other. On Codex website, you can find a list of the commands to program the projectors using a remote control. Once you have determined which type of projector you'll need, the selection of a lens is a bit easier and probably more familiar to you, as it is similar to selecting a lens for any other sort of projection equipment. Lens selection is determined by your required screen size and the constraints of the gallery that you are working in. Helpful to have on hand is a lens chart, which is also available on the Kodak website. If you know two out of the three constraints, you can always figure out the third. For example, if you know that your image needs to be, I know it's really tiny, six feet on its longest side and you have a 120 millimeter lens, then you'll know that your throw distance should be 21 feet. Keep in mind that you always want to be working with the longer dimension of your screen, whether your slide is oriented portrait or landscape. Lenses are referred to by their focal length, usually measured in millimeter, but can also be measured in inches. To compare, it's as simple as converting the inches to millimeter or vice versa. There are also curved lenses and flat lenses. In most instances these days, we will want to use a flat field lens with a cardboard or plastic mounted slides. A curved lens should be used if you're projecting open mounted slides, which you most likely won't be running into. Anything less than 100 millimeters is typically considered a wide angle lens and can be used to create a larger image with a shorter throw distance. And anything over 100 millimeters is considered a telephoto lens, useful for long throw distances, like what we're using here in the auditorium. One thing to keep in mind is that different manufacturers' lenses, while they may be the same size, will most likely have different effects on the color of your projected image, which Jeffrey touched on yesterday. <clears throat> there are basically three lamps that you have to choose from, whether you're using an ectographic or an ectopro machine. They're all 300 watt, 82 volt lamps with round bi-pin ceramic bases and built-in MR13 type mirror reflectors. The first bulb, the FHS, is most likely what you will be selecting for an installation because they have the longest life at 72 hours. Note that 72 hours is only nine days if a, if a projector is on for eight hours per day. So you'll be going through a lot of lamps by in bulk. The next lamp option is the EXR, and while it's 15% brighter than the FHS, it has half of the life. If you need a lot of brightness, there is the EXW, which is 30% brighter than the EXR, but is rated for less than half the life of the EXR. The lamp can potentially melt slides, so if they are projected for more than a minute at a time, you might want to keep an eye on them. If your throw distance is very far, you might consider the EXW, but you should consult a conservator about the effects, the effects this might have on your slide. At the Hirshhorn, we tend to use the FHS lamp, and in combination with our hours of operation, I change out the slides every two to three weeks. However, in some extreme cases, like that of Giovanni's Anselmo's Invisible, where one slide is projected sim continuously for the entire day, we may sw switch out the slides weekly because of fading. It's also important to remember that when you are changing the lamp, you must not touch the inside of the lamp where the reflectors are because the oils from your fingers um, will make the lamp life much less and will potentially blow the second you turn the projector on. Synchronizers or dissolve units are tricky and depending on how old you are, you may have personal experience with them that greatly exceeds my own. Dove is a big name in the slide control business, or at least they used to be. Produced in the 80s by the company Audiovisual Laboratories, or AVL, they use a programmable language called PROCOL, which stands for Programmable Computer Audiovisual Language Library. The PROCOL produces cues called a positrack that are then hidden in a channel of music playing from a stereo tape deck. You would use one channel to play music if your piece has sound, and the other to direct the Dove unit, which would then control up to four ectographic projectors. There are several different types of cues created by this language, and the type of cues your program has will determine which Dove unit you can use. Finding people who still have the knowledge and the machines required to write new ProCall 
and convert it to audio tracks is all but impossible. I have only used the Dove X2 unit and have been told that they are the most reliable of all. Currently on the second floor in Supersensorial, the work by Helio Odesica and Neville D. Almeida, Trash Escapes, is a two projector installation with a soundtrack that is being controlled by a Dove X2. The soundtrack, which is on a CD, already has the cues recorded in the right channel. So the setup looks something like this. The left channel comes out of the player in a split using an RCA Y cable and goes through both channels of a standard stereo amplifier and out to the speakers. The right channel connects to the Dove unit with an RCA and two projectors are connected to the Dove using a seven pin connection. Here's what the pause track on that piece sounds like. Prepare yourself. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, if you are not tied to a pre-existing Dove program or have time and information needed to recreate the cues, I've been advised to use the Arian Show Wizard digital audio presentation system in lieu of the Dove controller. This system more easily integrates with today's technology or at least something closer to today's technology. It allows you to create an MP3 file on a flashcard to synchronize the soundtrack while controlling up to 16 machines. When you are selecting equipment for a multi-channel installation, you will typically want to ensure that your machines are identical piece for piece. This means checking lamp modules to ensure that they are all either high brightness modules or regular modules. You can see here in this diagram the path that the light takes through the lamp module of an Ektapro machine. From the lamp, the light hits a dichroic mirror where some of the infrared light is absorbed, decreasing overall heat output and resulting in a whiter light. After that, in non-high brightness modules, you will find a heat absorbing lens, and in high brightness modules, you won't. From there, the light travels through the condenser lens, which takes the light and focuses the beam through the gate and the slide out of the lens onto the wall. All of these components can have effect on the look of your image. You want to have all new lamps to start and also plan to change your lamps at the same time on a schedule to avoid unwanted outages during gallery hours. Here, I typically change my lamps every Friday, so we are less likely to have an outage over the weekend when our response time is slower because no one's here. During the course of the show, you'll need to maintain the projectors. Dust is another major issue. The Ektapro side trays have plastic tops that help to keep slides clean, so when I can, I try to use those. You'll need to clean the projectors every few days to keep the dust down. Kodak recommends that you use canned air, a lens cloth, lens cleaner, and a soft brush to clean out the machines. I go a step further and use an electronics vacuum to get all the dirt. The slides themselves get extremely dusty very quickly. These are relatively easy to clean, but as they are the primary media and they must be cleaned so frequently, if you are not trained in conservation, you, be, you should be checking with your conservator about best practices in order to avoid damaging the slides. Usually I clean the slides using canned air, making sure not to let any condensation spray onto the slides. Another issue you may run into is your autofocus not working. One of the main causes of this is a cracked ref reflector in one of the lamps. So the first thing to try is changing the lamp. If that still doesn't work, pull out the lamp module and check the alignment of the condenser lens, which must be perpendicular to the mount and can easily move out of place, especially during shipping. Between the fan rattling, oh, excuse me. Another issue I've run into is a very noisy machine between the fan rattling and the slide tray vibrating. The fan, while difficult to clean without taking the machine apart, is important to keep fairly clear of dust. A quick pass with the vacuum should do the trick. For a noisy tray, some weights on top should remedy the situation. Finally, there is the human factor. We have sometimes modified machines to make their controls less tempting or less accessible to visitors by removing their buttons or placing plexiglass covers over them. If your projector must be installed on a low pedestal that is accessible to the public, expect that they will touch it and make your installation resistant to tampering. Long-term care of these machines may prove to be tricky. Replacement parts are difficult to come by, and there are people, but there are people who are making stand-ins. Ectographic machines refurbished, excuse me, uh, range between, I don't know what I'm doing, range between 150 to 500 dollars, and Ectapro is between 500 to 1,000, depending on the model. While you can source items on eBay, you must take into account, I don't, sorry, this goes out completely. 
You must take into account that you are not purchasing support when you do that, and that if things go wrong, you will be on your own. There are a few specialists out there, like Ken at KX Camera, who back up their work and are happy to assist as much as they can in keeping these machines working in working condition for many years to come. These few remaining old timers are also a treasure trove of information about these products. I would like to reiterate and thank my main resources of invaluable information for this presentation. Kodak's website, Ken Kobolensky at KX Camera, and Steven Mickelson, a multi-image slide programmer. Thank you. Okay. No questions? Yeah, are there any oh. questions? Hi. Uh, I just was wondering whether you ever use glass mounted slides. It looks like the slide that you showed um, was just uh, the film in the carrier. Yeah, I haven't run into glass mounted slides here. Um, I don't know if I would rule it out in the future. I don't know if anyone, have you guys run in? Yeah, Jeffrey's saying he has glass mounted slides. Yes. Reed? Yes. yes, we haven't had any that I know of. I haven't installed any. I didn't look into those if they are. It's still producing. Does anyone else know? Who is still making them? I think we're going to give you a microphone. I think it's on, yeah. There's a French firm called Simda, spelled S-I-M-B-D-A. It's still making projectors and their lookalikes of the Ectopros, uh, their models on Ectopros. Great. I wouldn't know that. <laughs> Maurice? Uh, so I, I noticed when you did the little uh, breakdown on, on the lamp modules, you had a little uh, print on the It's really hard to see. I know. Sorry. Uh, I noticed that when you had your breakdown of the lamp modules, one that was a dual lamp and one that was a single lamp, yeah. that you, um, you put the little um, uh, comment there exactly that heat filter. Um, is, is on some models. Yeah. Wouldn't it be advantageous to put that filter on all your projectors so that it cuts the infrared down and it makes your slides last that much longer? I've heard that they do help to cut the infrared down, but the way they do that is by adding a green glass, which I don't know if that changes the color of your slide. I assume it would, but that would probably help to keep the life longer, but I don't know. They actually, you know, you can, the infrared glass you can actually get is, which is almost basically clear. Oh, and so and it, um, it will just reflect the infrared way. And if you keep the infrared off the slides, then it will It'll keep the heat down and right. make them not fade you know, as, as quickly. As quickly, yeah. Yeah. I'm Could be to. a nice addition. Um, I, would, I would like to, thanks for your great presentation. Um, um, I would like to add a comment uh, regarding servicing those projectors because we just ran into that problem when we acquired the piece that Jeffrey briefly introduced yesterday. If you remember Sharon Hayes' installation with the 13 uh, projectors on stands. Um, we basically, the artist basically eBayed together a whole bunch of different used um, um, slide projectors in various conditions and she just, um, gave them to us and we tested them and decided which of the 20 would be the 13 that we use for exhibition that would be like working best. And I had put some money aside for servicing, but um, I ran into the problem that in New York City there was no longer a service company with Kodak certified technicians mm -hmm. that they would have working on those Ectopros and Ectographics. And the company refused to open the Ecta Pros because they were scared that um, I would sue them or something if the condition was, um, you know, 
worse than before or something. And they simply didn't have the Kodak certified person anymore. So they directed me towards someone in Washington that would still do that. But it was so expensive. Mm -hmm. It was 800 bucks per projector, like, a cle like just a service, relooping and everything. Did you have it done? That I did. No, I didn't have the money, money in my budget. So, yeah. you know, um, I had some of them serviced. The actor graphics they still took on, but the actor pros, um, I ran into the problem because I hadn't foreseen uh, that because. amount of money being necessary for proper servicing. So, um, um, long story short, <laughs> I think it's really important if we work with these slide pieces to, um, to inquire before the show how much the service is going to cost. And then ideally, I think they should be serviced before and after um, the show to get them in good, uh, good condition again, have, have them dusted. I mean, the dusting we can do in-house as well and part of the relooping, but if it comes to the really technical parts, I don't feel that I'm skilled enough to do that. I know that Tina at Tate is doing it herself. Maybe yeah, she wants to. she was saying that last night. <laughs> what were those projectors? So are those considered part of the piece now where you're not allowed to change the models? Um, they are, I didn't, we didn't dedicate them to that piece. They, they are in our shared obsolete equipment mm -hmm. pool. Yeah. Um, to comment on that, I think what we've been doing now over the last six years is to get specialists in to train us what needs doing and then sort of pass that knowledge on to every new technician that sort of comes in. And I think to the earlier question with the heat sinks, quite frankly, the, the 2050 carousels, they have an intestine lamp, so the need of your heat sink, which is the green sort yeah. of appearance one, is a lot more crucial in order to keep the heat out where the halogen ones just cause a little bit heat um, by nature. Mm. And, um, but a lot of the uh, old Coda guys, they're still out there and you'd only need to find them and get them in and spend time together with them. To learn everything. Bake a cake and, and I'm sure you could come up with, with very good sort of video captured manual because if you do it regularly, you sort of really get in the mode and there's very little that can go wrong. Yeah. And the, the only worry that, that we often have is we sort of gone through phases in servicing all the slide projectors at one time just to get it out of the way and loop them. But quite often once you've looped them, increased them and don't use them, the, the crease is going to get stalled. So quite frankly you have the, the opposite effect in actually creating more damage or trying to then get rid of the uh, sort of deteriorated crease right. if you don't use the projectors regularly enough. It's we just undust and get, get rid of um, the sort of excess of the crease and then when the projector comes back into action, we sort of then do the looping and the creasing because then we know that it's going to be running and distributed to those bearings that need crease and lubrication. We have, a few, oh, yeah, more. we have a few more minutes okay. if there are more questions. Otherwise, I thank you, Sarah, for this very informative talk. Thank you.